I love those old school ghost stories, written from the point of view of an unreliable narrator. It's that intimate human quality to them where it leaves you dubious over the accuracy or believability of what you've been told, especially when presented like it's potentially one of many unspoken accounts of a long haunted history. They are usually simple, subtle stories that allow your imagination to ponder over unexplained mysteries rather than dealing with complex or surreal premises that sometimes overshadow what makes them creepy to begin with. In 2018, there were two specific films that brought the horror genre back to basics in a way that reminded me of why I love the genre to begin with. One of these films was Garth Marenghi creator Matthew Holness's 70s-esque expressionistic inspired possum that I hope to cover another time, but the other film happens to be my favourite horror movie of 2018, and I'm convinced it doesn't get the credit it deserves. So let's enter the world of ghost stories. Ghost Stories was originally a stage production created by Jeremy Dyson and Andy Newman, Dyson being the behind the scenes quarter that made up the comedy trip The League of Gentlemen, and Newman being an actor, writer and director who co-wrote and produced several televised and theatrical productions with illusionist and mentalist Darren Brown. They make up quite a unique pair of writers. On the one hand you have Dyson with his darkly surreal sense of humour, and on the other you have Newman with his well researched understanding of psychological and paranormal paranormal phenomenon. In many ways, Ghost Stories is a passion project deeply rooted in Dyson and Newman's interest in our relationship with the macabre and unexplained. If there is something it does universally well, it's condense actual psychology in what they describe as existential terror. In the film, Newman plays Professor Philip Goodman, who presents a show about debunking psychic mediums and paranormal circumstances akin to the work of James Randi, a former magician turned academic skeptic. It establishes the harmful real world nature of using the paranormal to exploit the human condition, that echoes the work Newman did with Darren Brown such as Messiah, a TV documentary special that explores how people seek answers to tragic, troubling and bewildering events through unconventional means that have a profound effect on their lives. Like the documentary, the film presents the paranormal as not purely about fear, but rather a means of guidance, reflection and revelation, because it's such a unique phenomenon personal to that individual that it must mean something to them if society rejects it as absurd or unbelievable. Goodman comes from the latter perspective, perpetuating this cynical realism that everything can be explained with logic and science, even if psychology is filled with theories and unexpected explainable paradoxes already. The story simply challenges rationale, and abides by this premise that the brain sees what it wants to see, and from there, watching the film unfold becomes this weirdly enigmatic experience. Ghost Stories is a sincere love letter to the genre, not simply in its direct cinematic and theatrical influences, but more so how it makes such ordinary, mundane, everyday events feel practically nightmarish based on our emotional disposition. Effectively, the film is somewhat of an anthology. After years of feeling jaded by his career, Goodman's greatest inspiration, paranormal investigator Charles Cameron, completely denounces skepticism after being unable to explain three distinct supernatural cases, and dares Goodman to investigate them for himself. The first case involves a xenophobic security worker called Tony Matthews, who sees some creepy girl stalking the construction site he's guarding, where of course it seems like your average spooky claustrophobic abandoned building setup, but what each story emphasises is not so much the horror, but more so the psychological response of each character. In Matthew's case, the quiet, isolated setting makes him hyper aware of the smallest sounds, meaning he tries to drown out the silence so he doesn't become irrational over nothing and is able to calm his nerves. While he could harp on about the lack of dramatic stylization making the scene more grounded and authentic, the horror serves to bring out more of his character. At first he shows a lot of bravado and defensiveness, but it's slowly chipped away to show how emotionally vulnerable he is, that's only reinforced by such a literally isolating job. 
When he finally encounters the creepy girl after a prolonged sequence of on the edge of your seat tension, it doesn't actually linger on the supernatural fear, but instead it abruptly cuts to Goodman investigating Matthew's background, where it's revealed he was a very lonely man who had an estranged relationship with his daughter, and after his ordeal with the creepy girl who is implied to just want someone to love her, he finally met with his daughter again, rekindling their relationship and finding some sort of solace in his life. As I said, the horror actually impacted his life for the better, as opposed to what we conventionally assume to be the worst. And yes, we will get to how this all unravels later on, but for now, the human experience matters more than simply just setting itself up for elaborate scares, especially considering the next case. Simon Rifkin's story is by far both the funniest and most unnerving due to his weird MC Escher style parents. What's interesting about Simon is how he contrasts greatly from Matthew's nonchalant don't give a shit attitude as someone severely consumed by anxiety and paranoia. Basically one night he commits a hit and run against a demon who then stalks him down a desolate empty road and toys with him. Stay. The entire point of the story seems to reinforce this more exaggerative, overactive imagination of an emotionally different type of person, whereas Matthews gets to the point in his account, Simon's story seems so displaced from the tone the film sets at the beginning that his experience doesn't seem to add up. For as quirky and fun as the story is, to give us breathing room from the somber atmosphere that came before it, Simon's more bizarre recollection is exactly the kind of Jersey Devil style story where people will have a hard time taking seriously. We can't prove whether or not it happened as Goodman investigates this scene himself, but given how profoundly shaken it leaves an already nervous Simon, the unexplainable mystery leaves a haunting legacy on us, similar to real urban myth. Whereas the first story ends with Goodman discovering Tony Matthews' newfound lifestyle and somewhat condescendingly dismissing it, the second story leaves Goodman feeling uncomfortable, because as the film later reveals, he starts to see too much of his own life in Simon's. The feeling Goodman's character puts across is repressive. We don't really learn anything about him until the conclusion. Before that, he's quite neutralised given he's simply a curious observer and scrutinizer of the stories he's being told, yet he approaches each case pessimistically and borderline arrogantly as described by Cameron. He struggles to empathise with what he coldly considers his subjects and it makes him out to be quite an unlikable protagonist. But going into spoiler territory, the major revelation is that the entire plot is centred around him coming to terms with his own emotional torment. There's a reason his character is so unlikable, and it's foreshadowed throughout the film that there's something not quite right about his world. Other than the story segments, we see everything from his perspective, but that perspective is also presented with haunting imagery and ambiguous superstition, contradicting his belief that there is no such thing as ghosts or supernatural qualities. Notice how the world feels eerily empty. We only see Goodman and those he interviews or observes, making his investigation seem more like a purgatory, and that's because it is. In the final story, wealthy financer Mike Priddle explains how he was once haunted by a poltergeist while waiting for his wife to give birth, who ultimately dies, leaving him alone with a newborn baby, and he ends the story by committing suicide. It's the least interesting but most impactful narrative given its context, and what that context does is unearth everything we need to know about Goodman. He returns to Cameron, who reveals himself to be Mike Priddle this entire time, acting as this somewhat devil presence trying to force Goodman to come to terms with his childhood trauma. The deeply depressing reality is that Goodman's life has been completely suppressed by guilt. He spent his entire life trying to get back at the world by inadvertently destroying other people's hope because society sees it as irrational or implausible, and thus he's never been able to escape this perpetual feeling of loneliness. 
He gets immediately defensive when anyone questions him, despite how much he questions the lives of others. We learn about the psychology of each individual character except for him, and that's because each individual character mirrors his troubled existence. Every story is based on guilt. I interpret Tony's story about not having a better connection with his daughter as Goodman regretting not having a better relationship with his ailing father and his religious indifference. I see Simon as Goodman's younger self being scared of the world and unable to look past his fears, even in the smallest of things. And then Mike being Goodman's obsession with work, overshadowing his ability to have a family and care for those he loves if any. It culminates in Goodman reflecting on his childhood, where bullies who tormented him forced a disabled boy into a sewer where he dies of an asthma attack, leaving Goodman feeling guilty of not being able to save the boy, hence his career is consumed by the idea of allegedly helping people to see their reality, when in fact what he thinks is a noble intent is actually a delusional complex. It concludes with Goodman being in a coma this entire time, following a suicide attempt implied earlier, with the characters being a manifestation of the hospital staff that surrounded him while in his persistent vegetative state. I understand the ending was considerably polarizing to many people, but I think it's genuinely brilliant because, uh, dare I say it, it's quite meta in the context of traditional ghost stories. The true horror is that Goodman wanting to repress his guilt and fear is now trapped in a never-ending loop of the same nightmares that have plagued his imagination for years, leading to his suicide attempt. It's an extremely dark revelation that makes the circumstances all the more painful. He was already too late to rectify his problems, he ignored all the signs of wanting to better himself and I suppose others in the process but instead became deeply cynical and narrow-minded in his goals that it caused him more harm than good. Ghost Stories may not be the most lavishly provocative horror film of 2018, but for me, using the supernatural to reflect on our fears and doubts brings out a universal truth. For as much as we want to live our lives without worries, we should take it as a sign that we need to embrace problems when there's something off lingering at the back of our minds. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching and thank you very much for the comments from last week's video. That was uh, very kind and inspiring going into 2019. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you thought of ghost stories and even let me know what your favorite horror movie of 2018 was or even just your favorite film in general was. Um, if you enjoy what I do here and you want to support the channel, you want to help me to make more videos, get early access, even vote on the occasional future video, uh, you can do so by heading over to Patreon where you can support me there. I am extremely grateful for those that do and yeah until next time uh, head over to instagram and twitter that's where i am if you want to talk all sorts of nonsense and other non-horror shenanigans and until next time once again stay safe and i'll see you all very soon bye <laughs>